What happens when your anointing looks like what happened to me when I was down for three days and they thought that I was lost, but all of a sudden the grave couldn't keep me down. When people didn't expect it, when people didn't know what was about to happen, boom, the third day came and baby I arose. What happens when you go through what looks like what happened to me? Hello and thanks for tuning in to the Spiritual Encounter broadcast with me, your host, Pastor Gerald A. Johnson. I'm so glad that you decided to tune in today. We've got some very good information to release to you. Lately, here at Faith Culture, we've been dealing with the topic of taking off the grave clothes. In John chapter 11, Jesus Christ had a best friend whose name was Lazarus. And Jesus went to the town to free him of his death. The Bible says that he went to that particular place and he said, roll away the stone. And when he called Lazarus to come forth, he came out, but he was still bound. The Bible says bound by his hands, by his feet, with a wrap on his head and grave clothes. In this series, I'm discussing with Christians how they have been made alive in Christ, but sometimes we still wear the clothes of the past. Watch closely as we talk about taking off the grave clothes. Today, we're going to deal with the feet. Because it said that his hands were bound, his head was wrapped, he had on grave clothes and his feet were bound. Whenever we deal with the feet, we're dealing with direction. Some of us don't know where we're going. Some of us are lost because our feet still have grave clothes on them. If you are a believer, God did not cause you to just exist. He caused you to live. You're going somewhere. You are not stuck. You're moving higher. You're expanding. You're enlarging your territory. God is always trying to uplift you and give you an upgrade. Some of us need to kick the grave clothes off of our feet. And this is how. Before I tell you this, I need you to prophesy. I, I know I heard you. I had you talking to each other a lot. But at least I don't have you touching on each other a lot. Touch your neighbor and say neighbor. Then people get pregnant after service and all that. But just <laughs> declare this. Declare this. And one time I was sitting next to a preacher. And the preacher just kept, he just had, he had it in his spirit to keep touching his neighbor. And the neighbor was me. And he just kept touching his neighbor. And so, uh, let me see, what's the best way to say this? I think I disrespected my elders. Because I was like, bro, stop. He's a preacher, like, just stop, bro, just stop. It's too much, too much, too much touching. So I don't have people touch each other a lot. But open up your mouth and say this over each other. <laughs> Prophesy this. Now, I'm joking, but this is true. When you speak and decree a thing and declare a thing, there's life on your words. You are a believer. You're speaking from the life-giving source that Jesus gave you. The person next to you needs you right now. I want you to look at someone next to you and say, you are not stuck. You are going somewhere. Okay, chains are breaking. Look at someone else and say the same thing. You are not stuck. You're going somewhere. Now, I want you to be like Jesus was. Jesus said, I'm not going to whisper this thing. Lazarus is dead, so I need to shout this thing. Look at that person, point at them and say, go! Go! feel like something just changed. Something just changed. You're on a journey. You're not stuck. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. The grave clothes, and this is where I'm going with this whole thing. The grave clothes that are on your feet as it relates to your journey is probably people who shouldn't be in your life. People. Some of the grave clothes that are on our feet are the associations that we carry that keep tripping us up. Has us in jail. We can't take big steps because we're being held back by small people. Let me, let me work with this a little bit. I want to talk about relationships. I want to deal with relationships. And I want you to, to start understanding that God 
is about to release you from some people. And he's about to bring some people in your life to give you an upgrade. And the details matter. Everyone lives in the earth, but everyone does not have permission to live in your world. Some people are just not assigned to you. And some people are assigned to you. And the people that are supposed to be in your life, they cannot what? Leave. And the ones that are not supposed to be in your life, they can, well, the people that are assigned to your life, they cannot go. And the ones that are supposed to be in your life, they cannot what? Stay. Here's the deal with relationships. I'm going to give you a few points. What qualifies me to be able to talk about relationships? Well, marrying all these people, counseling all these people, you learn a few things. You start seeing people who are damaged goods because of the associations that they kept. Some of you have been in relationships for 10 to 15 to 20 years that fell apart, and you realize later that it was all a big waste of time. By the show of hands, how many of you have been in relationships over 10 years that almost destroyed your life? At one point in time, hands all up, hands all around the building. At one point, now, 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 this shows you, this verifies to you that I'm speaking truth to you. God is about to release people who've been binding you for decades. Never give exclusive access to any relationship until at first the relationship has been tested. Test every relationship, everyone around me. I do not allow people in my inner circle until I know that they were with me when I was struggling. Or with me when I went through. Or didn't talk about me when other people talked about me. Who was with you in your struggle? That's how you test relationships. Brothers and sisters are not born over a handshake or over a milkshake. Brothers and sisters are born when your life is shaken up. That's how you can tell who's really supposed to be there. When I went through, where were you? Proverbs chapter 17. We're going to release you from some relationships and, bring, and give you a gateway to bring some new relationships into your life so that you can have proper direction and get the grave clothes off of your feet. Amen. Proverbs chapter 17 says this, and verse 17 should be on the screen. A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born through what? Adversity. That's how you tell right there. A brother or a sister is born when you're going through something. Until then, they're a constituent. When they're with you in your struggle and stay with you through the struggle, that's who's supposed to be in your life. Verse 18 says, a man devoid of understanding shakes the hand and enters into a pledge and becomes a surety for his friend. What this means is that you're co-signing for people that you really don't know. Let me, let me, let me give you guys a quick tip here. Don't co-sign for anybody at all. Because people with good intentions at that season can turn on you in an instant and take your whole credit under the ground. Don't co-sign for anyone. I don't have any loans out. You know why? Because everything that I gave, everything that I have, the people have, that's mine. I gave it to them. That way I don't hold them accountable when they mess up. I'm going to show you an instance. As I have about seven to eight more minutes to finish this up, I'm going to show you an instance in a man named David's life, how he was able to understand who's supposed to be in his life. David was a great, mighty man of God, the most famous king in Israel. Right now, thousands of years later, the Israeli flag is still the star of David. He's still talked about on Sunday mornings. He's still talked about in the Muslim circles. He's still talked about in the, uh, the Jewish circles. David is the man. He was so powerful, that he, he, so powerful that he united two kingdoms together. The Bible says that he has supernatural anointing on him to the point where he killed a bear, and he killed a lion, and he killed a giant, and he killed 1,000 people at one time. As a matter of fact, it says 10,000 people at one time. It says Saul killed his thousands and David killed his ten thousands. David was powerful, but David found himself in a mess. His life was shaken up. He was afraid. He got to this point where his own blood betrayed him. What do you do when the people who you love the most and gave the most to chew you up like a piece of juicy fruit gum when they think you're done and spit you out? I'm talking to somebody today. 
Absalom, his son, would do this. Now, in those days, I'll give you a little biblical ed education. In the days of the kings, it wasn't like how it is right now with Barack Obama or, or any other king or president. The king was also a judge. And what would happen is he would sit on his throne and God would give him divine, supernatural wisdom how to solve problems. And people would come to him and say, king, I've got this situation. King, I've got this situation. All of a sudden, God would download on him what to do. He'll solve the problem and the people would love him and stay in the kingdom. But his son Absalom, who hated him, his own blood wanted to have him dead. What he would do is this. He would go out every morning and he would stand at the gate of the king's palace. And when people came to the king to get advice, he stepped in the way in David's kingdom. And he would say, what is your problem and where are you from? And he would solve their problem. And he would say things like, if I were, you know, I know he's the man, but, but if I would, this is what I would do. If I was a God, this is how I would handle it. Just, I wish somebody would make me judge in Israel. And then people would come to him again and he would lift them up and he would kiss them. But the issue is, he has so much bitterness inside of him, so much bacteria inside of him, that he did that for 40 years straight. 40 years. He stood there and betrayed his own, his own father. Just like a cancer. And so David, although he was the anointed king of Israel, the anointed one, he was afraid of his son. His son went to a different town. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Read it in your own time. Uh, his son went to a different town and gathered up a posse, working up a team behind his father's back. The next thing you know, he shouted out in the city, I am king now. I'm the man now. I'm coming to take over. And David got up, found himself in a mess. His life was shaken up. He, he, he got up and he ran outside of the town, anointed to be king. What do you do when you know that you're a king, but you feel like an abandoned bum? You know the will of God is on you. You know his promises. You know what he told you. But you let someone who was smaller than you threaten your purpose. We all go through that. I've been through that many times. I know you called me, but did you call me? I know for a fact you called me, but did you call me? Because according to you, you let this person do that to me. You allowed this to happen to me. And God is saying, I allowed that thing to happen to you, not for you but so that you can go through it to be eligible to help somebody else come out of it. And stop thinking about you. It's about what I'm about to do through you. You ask me to use you. You ask me to anoint you. But what happens when my anointing looks like what happened to me? I was betrayed. I was wounded. I was put up on a cross, but I saved the whole world. What happens when your anointing looks like what happened to me when I was down for three days and they thought that I was lost, but all of a sudden the grave couldn't keep me down. When people didn't expect it, when people didn't know what was about to happen, boom, the third day came and baby, I arose. What happens when you go through what looks like what happened to me? So David's there now outside of the camp. I'm going to pick this up. Before I say that, some of you have people in your lives who don't want your heart, they want your sponsorship. Really, somebody's really being helped. They don't want your life, they want your sponsorship. But you'll be able to tell when the charitable funds run out. <laughs> Who's really for you? Second Samuel chapter 15, I'm almost done. 17 verse. And I'm ready to bless this oil, give some people some oil changes. 17 verse says this, picking up the story. And the king went out with all the people after him. This is when he was running away. And stopped at the outskirts, verse 18. Then all the servants passed before him. All the Cherethites, all the Pelethites, all the Gittites, a hundred men who had followed him from Gath and passed before the king. What he did was he got to the outskirts and then he stopped. He got in a situation where he was shaken up and then he just stopped. Sometimes when you're in a situation, you're shaken up and your life is dark, you need to just stop moving. Just, just stop and pay attention to what's going on around you. Because the people around you could be the thing that's grounding you. 
the people around you could be the thing that's stopping you. So David just stopped for a second and paused. He says, you know what? We're going somewhere, but everyone, everyone just walked past me. Let, me. let me take a look at you real quick. So he looked at everyone. Then the king said to Atai, the Gittite, he says, why are you going with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile in your own place. In fact, you just came yesterday. Should I make you a wanderer up and down with us today since I do not know where I'm going? David, the anointed king of Israel, David, the man of God, didn't know where he was going. Some of you are in a place right now that you do not know where you're going. You're lost and you have no direction, and baby, it's okay. Even David didn't know where he was going. It's all right, as long as you know who's taking you somewhere. As long as you know that God will never leave you or forsake you. He'll be with you always until the end of the age. God's got your back. You don't have to know. God gives you information on a need-to-know basis. Because if you knew the journey all the way, you mess it up by taking detours. God says, I don't want you to know why. Because I want to date you and romance you and give you a surprise. I want to shock you. I want to cause you to be inspired and awed by me. I want to shock your world and I want to shock your friends and family members. So I'm not telling you everything. It's on a need to know basis. But what I'm telling you right now is don't stop. Just keep walking. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm just walking. I'm moving by faith. I'm walking in the spirit. It doesn't feel comfortable, but I trust God. I'm walking. Because he did it for me yesterday, he'll do it for me again. Move your feet a bit, just prophetically like you're walking. Here's what the guy said to him. But Atai answered the king and said, as the Lord lives. In other words, I swear to God, that's what he said. As the Lord lives and as my Lord the king lives, David, on your life, surely whatever place you go, I will be. Whether in death or in life, that's a real ride or die. Whether in death or in life, even there also will I be. If you're going to die, I'm with you. If you want to live, I'm with you. When you're high, I'm with you. When you're low, I'm with you. When your family members turn their backs on you, I'm with you. That's what qualifies a person to be with you and to be considered your friend. Notice this. If you go back a couple of verses, David says something to him. Verse 20, he says, in fact, you came only yesterday. Should I make you wander up and down? May I, may I submit this thought to you? It doesn't matter how long a person has been with you. You have some people who've been in your lives for 14, 15 years, and the dagger is 14 inches deep. Every year, a sharper dagger. But you have some people that's going to come in your life tomorrow. Some people that's been in your life for a month that'll go with you until the wheels fall off. Yeah. Let's keep reading. So David said to Ittai, go and cross over. You're going somewhere and you're about to cross over. I'm telling you, prophetically, the Lord is saying that you're about to get over this hump. You're about to cross over this bridge. You're about to go over. But I want to bless you and you've got some people with you that I'm not trying to bless right now. Could it be that your blessing is being held back by somebody who's not qualified but too close to you? Mm -hmm. Could it be that your blessing is being held back by someone who's robbing you of the essence of God on you because God doesn't want your reputation to be connected to something he's still working on? Could it be that the person that you're dating is the one that's a trap for you? Could it be that you worshiping your children too much is your trap? Could it be that your mother-in-law is your trap? Could it be that your father-in-law is your trap? Could it be that you're too in love with the relationship you have with yourself and you're your own trap? Could it be? Just a question. David said, cross over. The ones that are qualified to cross over are the ones that were with you when your life was shaken up. Someone say cross over, cross over, cross over. Now, let me show you something really quick. A couple more minutes. Change. The people in your inner circle are indicators of change. The ones that are in your inner circle are indicators of change, meaning this. You'll know that your season is changing when the people around you start changing. Indicators of change. Genesis chapter 14 says that Abraham was walking 
with a guy named Lot who made these same promises that this guy made to David. Where you go, I'm going to go, your God's going to be my God. But conflict broke out. And when conflict broke out, he ran. After he ran, the Bible says, then the Lord spoke to Abraham and gave him his life assignment, gave him direction, took the grave clothes off of his feet. But it wasn't until the person left that God spoke. It's not until people leave, people who change or people who move, it's not until they release themselves from your life that God will start speaking to you. Why? Because he doesn't want you to share his secrets with everybody. Your life is a secret. Your life is a mystery. And God doesn't want you sharing that with everyone. So he's calling some people to exodus, salida, out of your life. I said a Spanish word. I'm powerful. Yeah. Magda didn't have said it. Change. He's trying to change. See, what the Lord is trying to do with you, he's trying to get you to change your personnel. You are your, you're your own business manager. God's trying to get you to change that personnel. Someone say change. change. The word change means to make or to become different. Something in you. The reason why you're stuck is that something inside of you needs to change right now. What is it that needs to change? Are you winning souls? Maybe you're not winning enough because something needs to change. Are you on the keys? Maybe, 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 maybe enough people are not being healed. Maybe you're not maximizing your potential on the keys. Not the guys here, but people who play keys because some, a chord needs to change. Is your clientele low in your salon? Maybe you need to, something has to change in your life. Is your marriage falling apart? The reason why it's falling apart, especially if it's God-ordained, is because something has to change. And God has been trying to elevate you. God's been trying to give you direction. But you refuse to change. Someone shout change. Change, change is good. Change is challenging. The change that I want you to talk about today or, or to do today is to change your, your personnel. How are we going to do that? We're going to release some people, and we're going to receive some people. Let me give you these indicators, and I'll let you go. We bless the oil, I'll let you go. Here's how you know who you're supposed to release first, and then who you're supposed to receive. Number one, God wants you to release yourself from toxic relationships, poisonous relationships. He wants you to let go of energy vampires. If you're connected to someone, and every time you talk to them, it drains you, that's an energy vampire. If, a per if you're talking to people and they never do what you tell them to do, that's an energy vampire. Maybe they are a good person, but maybe they're not your assignment. God called you to pour water on, on, on sponges and not rocks. Some people just won't receive from you, and it's okay. You just don't have the anointing for that particular person. They're a good person, but they're just not your person. Energy vampires. Do you feel weak after phone conversations? Is it hard? Do you dread to go to meetings with those people? Do you dread to think about them? That is an energy vampire. Loose them and let them go now. Number two, time robbers. People who are time robbers. And again, I love everyone. But I just know I don't want to rob you. I don't, want, I don't want to rob you of your destiny by making you think you're supposed to be a part of my inner circle. Do you see what I'm saying? Time robbers, the one precious commodity that you'll never get back again is your time. You matter to God. Every moment matters to God. God wants to use you big time in some way. And he doesn't want you to be slowed down. You're in this race, and he doesn't want people tripping you up by robbing you of your time. My time is very valuable. Not because I'm important, but because God is big in me. Number three, parasites. People who are parasites to you. Now what is a parasite? A parasite is crazy. The definition for a parasite is a symbiotic, non-mutual relationship between two organisms, usually when one is eating the other one from the inside out. A parasite gets inside of you and it eats at you slowly until it consumes you. So the question is, who is consuming you? Who is causing your hairline to recede? Who's causing you to have extra grades? Who's causing your bank account to be depleted? Who's, who's in your marriage too much when they shouldn't be there? Who is consuming you? And what's deeper is when it's what you call a macro parasite. A macro parasite is something that's very, very small and you can't see it and it's eating away at you. Who's too close to you that you can't really see them? Absalom 
was so close to his father that he couldn't see it, not for, not for one year, not for 10 years, not for 20 years, but for 40 years, blind by a macro parasite. You want to release yourself from those. And lastly, you want to receive some new people that God's trying to put in your inner circle. God's trying to give you a social upgrade. Someone say social upgrade. Social upgrade. He's trying to give you someone who's going to bring you a rate reduction. Less taxing. Someone easy to be around. Someone that receives easily. Someone with a low interest rate. That means that you're going to get back some, some return on this thing. You see what I'm saying? You're going to have some equity in there. You can look back and see that you've built up something with them. He's giving you a rate reduction. People who give you public likes and shares. Public likes and shares. Meaning, how many of you all have a Facebook? If you don't, get with the program, all right? Get a Facebook. You're behind. On Facebook, if a person puts a picture up or a status up, you can like it. But if you really like it, you'll share it with someone else. So God is trying to surround you with people who will like you, but also share what you're about. Share your life to other people and not try to be selfish with you. They'll, they'll share. Because if a person can't share, they're controlling. If they're controlling, that is the root of witchcraft. And also sharpeners. I teach my leaders this, that... Everyone needs to have a healthy social relationship. A healthy social relationship, which looks like this. Having someone who is higher than you, pouring into you. More knowledge, more wisdom, more anointing, more God, pouring into you. And then having someone who's beneath you, not beneath you as far as you're better than them, but they, maybe they don't know as much as you know. Someone that you can mentor and that you can pour into. And then someone who can sharpen you on your same level so that you don't believe your own press report. You don't become full of yourself. They can tell you about yourself. They'll tell you when the breath is stinking. They'll tell you when the shoes have got a hole in them. They'll tell you when, you, when your weave is crooked. They'll tell you about yourself. <laughs> Makeup's running. They'll tell you about yourself. When you don't have anyone above you pouring into you, then you become spiritually famished. And you can't give to other people. You become, you, you, you get into starvation. When you don't have anyone up under you, you become constipated. And you can't release. That's why some of you are mad at the people around you, always angry because you haven't had a chance to get a release because you have no one that you're pouring into. And then the hardest part is finding someone on your same level who can sharpen you and tell you about yourself. That's the hardest area for people, especially people who are leaders, to find someone on your same level. But you need those people around you to keep you. But there is another friend that you need. The Bible talks about this friend. I know I said I'm closing five times, but for real, this time, 30 seconds, I'm done. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, it says, a man who has friends must first be friendly. I don't have any friends. Well, check yourself. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that friend is Jesus. Jesus is a friend that will never forsake you. He's a friend that will never drain you. He's constantly pouring into you. He's a friend that will never leave you alone and leave you stranded. He'll be with you always until the end of the age. Jesus is that friend who sticks closer than your very blood. Why? Because he's the one who made you. He knows everything about you. And he wants you even in this moment right now. Well, I hope that you were blessed by that message. I hope that you were encouraged to take off what you used to dress like. You know, here at GAJM.TV, we have a ministry mandate to reach the lost for the world. We are called to teach the word, to demonstrate the power, to equip believers and impact the world. And you can be a part of what Jesus is doing in this part of the body. Some of you, you're called to be partners. And that means that when you connect with what we're doing, everything that we do every soul that's being saved everyone that's being uplifted you have a part in it i want you to pray about becoming a partner and i want you to pray about giving a donation to this ministry if you give the bible says it'll be given back to you pressed down shaken together and running over thanks a lot i'll see you next time